agenda and approving the meeting minutes. And um, what's our magic number? Nine. Yes. So we're currently two short. Two short. And Ashley's available if we absolutely need her, if we get a, another person. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So um, I will read some member updates here from. from Oh. Sorry, I forgot to use. There, now is that better? Can you hear me, Andrea? Okay, great. Okay, so um, we are not a quorum, um, so we are going to skip approve the agenda and approving the meeting minutes, and we will return to those later if we do hit quorum. Um, some member updates. Uh, Cheryl Hunsinger, our Douglas County Farm Bureau liaison, has stepped down, and so we are waiting on. Uh, the Farm Bureau to update, to appoint a new representative to us. Um, Crystal Bradshaw Gonzalez, had, um, our agricultural producer county appointment has also stepped down. So that is, we have two positions open right now. Um, one is a county appointment, is, I believe it's agricultural producer specific county. Okay. Um, so if you know of anybody in the county that's an ad producer that would want to join our board, um, I, um, reach out to them or pass them on to us. Um, and then uh, Quinn Carter um, has, uh, has stepped up to serve as our vice chair for the month of April. Um, first to serve on this seat, the new, our new rotational vice chair leadership structure. If you're like very confused what that means, read the meeting minutes from last month um, or you know talk to Connie, Cody or myself. Um, the remaining months of the 2024 calendar year are still available for members interested in taking this opportunity. Um, it's you know, it's going to be a rotational per month, very low stakes um, buy into that. And then welcome our intern, Jasmine Jonathan, um, our food systems intern with Douglas County. Um, and uh, Jasmine, you are a high school, uh, you're at the high school school of business. Mm -hmm. So thanks for having me on board. Um, all right. So, um, we have like two minutes, any like updates or announcements anybody wants to do before we jump on to Andrea. Teacher. Okay. I went to the environmental protection agency headquarters last week. And met with the person in charge of that. Or who's oh, for recording purposes. Oh, for recording. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're hybrid, so we're always gonna be available online. You gotta turn it on. I'm sorry. Okay. Last week I went to the Environmental Protection Agency headquarters in Washington, DC, and I met with Claudia Fabiano who directs all national efforts to prevent food waste. It was delightful. Uh, super exciting. Can't wait to hear more and pick your brain a little bit. Any other announcements? I um, just want to let everyone know that for the Eco Devo group, we spoke with two additional commissioners today about our project and went really well, got good feedback. And we are um, posed to be on the A May agenda for the city commission to look at that policy change. So, exciting. Tyler, you've moved so fast with this. This is really exciting. Um, I have a quick uh, announcement of uh, the North Lawrence exciting news is Sunflower Provisions, a delivery grocery store, has opened up their a little storefront. So, they kind of have a cool little bodega style thing. You can currently you can get like meats, cheeses, and a couple sundries and things um, with the, uh, they'll also have produce soon. And also I believe I just saw today, the Dollar Tree slash Dollar Family is closing in April 13th, I believe. So um, just some interesting food system updates for North Lawrence. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Andrea Clark. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Matt. Go yeah. Ahead. So on April the 27th and 28th, I'd like to invite you all to. We're having a uh, buffalo harvest um, that'll take place at Haskell on our grounds, by our power grounds, and then on Sunday the, the 
28th, we'll have a feast and it's going to be community wide. We yet to advertise out, but anybody can come. So um, it'll be a learning opportunity for us all. This has been something I've been working on for about six months and it's been very interesting just trying to figure out all the dynamics of it. 140 different tribes on our campus and every one of them having different ceremonials and certain ways of doing things. I think we've all got to a compromise, so I'm very excited about that. So, and then on the 20th, we're going to have a fashion show at Haskell, and you guys are totally welcome to come. Some of our students have made um, clothing designs and things for that, and then um, one of our students is doing a for profit. So, some some really big things that we got going on for extension and that stuff. Thank you, Maggie. That's really really exciting. All right, so we have with us today Andrea Clark, Director of Food System Planning um, from Casey Healthy Kids. And Andrea will be providing a presentation on growing an equitable and sustainable food system, a plan for collaborative action in regional KC. Are you ready, Andrea? Yeah, everybody. Yes. You have the floor. Take it away. Thank you, Connie. I'm having some uh, screen sharing issues, so Connie is going to uh, do the slides for me. Um, some of you, uh, well, a lot of you, um, I've seen at uh, two or three focus groups for this project over the last couple of years. Um, and so I think I presented last year sometime as well, so I'm excited to come back and show you the the final product and talk about what we're doing next. Um, again, my name is Andrea Clark. Um, I'm a food system planner at KC Healthy Kids and also in my role, um, support policy initiatives of the Greater Kansas City Food Policy Coalition. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so the, the coordinating team for this project um, consisted of um, five organizations, um, KC Healthy Kids was the lead applicant, um, along with Cultivate KC, Groundwork, Northeast Revitalization Group, um, New Growth in West Central Missouri, um, and Mid-America Regional Council. Um, you can move to the next slide. Um, the coordinating team um, managed and implemented the project and uh, with a lot of guidance and assistance. Um, from the advisory board, um, which consisted of um, food system leaders and stakeholders um, from urban and rural areas um, across the, the project area um, from different uh, sectors of the food system. Next slide. Um, we also had a um, number of community supporters um, like Douglas County Food Policy Council. Um, that helped connect us with stakeholders um, or host focus groups, um, get surveys out, things like that um, across the project area that we would like to acknowledge as well. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> um, the project um, was a two-year planning grant from the USDA Regional Food System Partnerships Project. Um, we also had matching funds from um, a variety of uh, community foundations um, from the area. Next slide. Um, so what prompted the project um, is when Regional Food System Partnerships funding became available um, from the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, one of our partners, um, Katie Nixon, some of you may know over at um, New Growth, um, and she's president of the board at Casey Food Hub and is also a farmer. Um, she really wanted, um, you know, stakeholders in the region to come together and um, apply for funding. Um, and in some initial meetings, what became clear is there wasn't a clear regional project to pursue. Um, so we took a step back. Um, and decided instead of applying for an implementation grant to back up and apply for the planning grant. Um, there are two different grant opportunities. Um, and so you all know, um, 
the benefits of regional food systems, local food systems, um, the challenges that we all face, um, how those challenges disproportionately impact um, different groups. Um, and so we really wanted to um, address some segregation and disconnection and um, uh, discoordination um, in across the region. Um, and uh, really wanted to focus on collaboration and creating a shared vision um, and a, a plan that we could all work together um, to put into action. Uh, next slide. So the goal of the project um, was to identify equitable and sustainable strategies um, to connect local food producers and consumers, to expand new and existing markets, uh, and to improve community food security. Next slide. Um, so there were kind of three key project activities. Um, the first was to put together the advisory board. Um, the first that was done in the, the first several months of the project. Um, then year one was spent on an assessment report um, that was we released that in last January, January 2023. And that was based on a year of research and engagement. Um, we did a few surveys. Um, hosted dozens of focus groups um, with folks like you all across the project area. Um, Mid America Regional Council gathered um, a whole bunch um, of data sets um, from state and federal sources and put them into a dashboard. Um, and uh, we had Porchlight Insights, um, which is a kind of uh, data storytelling group. Um, consultants um, help us pull it all together into a report that kind of distilled the key findings. Um, and then year two, um, we took um, all of that information um, and worked with stakeholders to turn that into um, an action plan to address some of the biggest challenges um, in the regional food system and to um, make use of uh, opportunities that were present as well. Uh, we had our advisory board um, through the assessment report identify some key priorities. Um, we hosted another round of focus groups um, where stakeholders voted for their top priorities, talked about potential strategies, um, maybe models that currently exist um, in our communities that are working well, um, potential partners, case studies from other cities that maybe we could implement here, um, which we did. Um, looked into um, and then from all of that information the advisory board helped narrow it down to eight goals um, with 27 strategies um, that we will dive into in a moment here uh, next slide um, so i mentioned focus groups um, we did two different rounds for the assessment and for the action plan and over the two years, we engaged 218 people at 22 focus groups in our eight priority counties. Um, so the project area was identified as a 100 mile radius um, outside of or around Kansas City um, so that it would include um, some of our rural producers that are selling at markets um, in Kansas City um, or in more urban parts of the, the region. Um, the counties that were selected um, we wanted to have a mix of urban and rural counties, um, uh, counties with different types of communities, um, you know, different percentages of um, racial and ethnic diversity, um, of uh, kind of income or wealth diversity, um, and also uh, places that we had existing connections um, that could help kind of welcome us into their communities um to engage with uh stakeholders um that they work with on a on a regular basis uh, next slide um i will skip this one this one is just kind of goes through how to navigate the digital plan online um, but i'll share some links later um so the action plan um for each goal or milestone towards our shared vision, um, we list strategies, um, highlight a model, 
um, and then list some potential partners. Um, there's so much work going on. Um, we obviously uh, did not highlight everyone um, or all of the work that's going on, um, but these suggestions or recommendations um, for kind of models and partners aren't meant to be exhaustive, but just a starting point um, for uh, who to collaborate with um, or uh, case studies to, to work off of. And next slide. Um, I'll just give a quick overview um, of the eight goals and highlight some of the strategies that are included. Um, but I won't go into those strategies in too much depth. Just want to give you a broad overview today. Um, but if you have questions about any specific goal or strategy, um, we can talk about it uh, in a little Q&A time afterwards. Um, so the first goal um, is for people experiencing food insecurity to have uh, consistent access to food, um, specifically um, culturally preferred or medically necessary food. And some of the strategies for this goal um, include advocating for policies that support this goal um, on a um, local, state, and federal level, um, to develop a guaranteed basic income pilot program um, for people uh, experiencing food insecurity, um, to support the ca capacity of food access programs, um, whether that's funding um, for more staff um, or uh, equipment so they can do things um, like some of the things that um, Just Food is doing in terms of um, processing some of the food, cooking some of the food, packaging it, um, things like that. There are more uh, food pantries that want to do work like that. They just don't have the space or the staff um, or volunteers or equipment to do it. Um, and then the last strategy is to explore alternative economies, um, such as Thelma's Kitchen um, or uh, the spot in Kansas City, Missouri, um, that have a, a pay what you can um, option um, for meals. Um, next slide, please. Um, goal two. Um, is to um, support our food system workers and local producers um, so that they have a sustainable livelihood, which includes um, a living wage, um, economic viability for their businesses, um, and access to physical and mental health care. Um, so again, another strategy for this is advocating for policies at the local, state, and federal level um, that support this goal. Um, it also includes exploring alternative um, health insurance or health care models. Um, uh, Ponta's work um, for uh, food is public work um, is in here developing a, a public food production pilot program um, and educating food system workers um, about uh, unions. Um, so those are our strategies for goal two. Next slide. Um, obviously, consumers need to know um, the benefits of local food and farms um, and um, know how, where to buy local food. Um, and so the strategies for this are pretty straightforward. Um, promote local food um, branding and marketing programs um, that already exist. Um, on the Missouri side, we have um, Missouri Grown or um, through things in Kansas like Shop Kansas Farms. Um, and then also um, uh, hosting and promoting on-site events um, that help consumers connect to local farms, um, whether that's through dinners, workshops, tours, um, community events, things like that. Uh, next slide. Goal four um, is that people of all ages um, especially youth and uh, beginning farmers have an entry point um, to local food system careers. Um, so strategies for this include um, expanding programs that introduce kids to local food and farms, um, like formal kind of farm to school programs, um, but also the informal programs where like community gardens or, um, you know, doing summer programs for kids or things like that. Expanding food and farm um, career programs, whether that's through um, technical colleges, community colleges, 
um, developing a scholarship for future food system leaders um, and expanding workforce development programs that are funded through the state um, to support beginning veteran and socially disadvantaged farmers. Next slide. Um, land access is obviously a big issue for local producers in urban and rural areas. Um, so some of these strategies include policy advocacy to support land access, um, developing a land link program to connect um, people who have farmland um, that want to lease or sell to farmers, um, partner with community land trusts so that um, more farmland uh, stays farmland um, and is owned by the community um, to explore cooperative land ownership models um, and to support incubator farm training programs like Common Ground and others around the region. Um, next slide. Um, goal six is to support the infrastructure that helps get food from the farm to consumers. Um, so this includes um, developing that um, middle uh, value chain infrastructure um, as well as technical support for farmers trying to navigate it or people that are trying to develop um, that infrastructure like cold storage or community kitchen or um, not community uh, certified kitchens um, or co-packing facilities um, to increase access to funding and capital um, we know a lot of times the USDA grants are out of reach um, for um, a lot of producers because of the matching funding or the their reimbursement only. So um, coming up with a way to provide bridge funding um, or something like that through community foundations to help bridge that gap. Um, and then conducting feasibility studies for additional infrastructure like food hubs. Um, so it was over 10 years ago now and there was a pandemic in between. Um, so um, conducting feasibility studies to, to see um, where the, the gaps and needs are um, and where the demand is. Next slide. Um, goal seven um, is to uh, support um, existing markets and to create new markets for local producers. Um, some of the strategies include supporting permanent year-round farmers market and retail stores, expanding farm to institution programs, um, advocating for local procurement policies um, with our municipalities or institutions, um, and then providing technical assistance to help producers um, get over those regulatory barriers like food cottage laws or safety laws, um, things like that. And uh, next slide. The last goal um, is uh, really about supporting um, food system organizations. Um, so creating a, a hub of information and resources um, that supports collaborative work um, that has information um, about different food system projects that are going on within the region and who to contact to get involved, um, links to different food system um, assessments and plans for the region, um, resources like um, information about grants, um, and then technical assistance uh, like to get help to apply for those grants, um, as well as improving and expanding um, kind of beta version dashboard um, that was created for this project um, so that we have easily accessible um, data that's relevant um, to the food system um, that we can go and pull, uh, you know, when we're putting grants together or making presentations or things like that. Um, you can go to the next slide. It's the last one. Um, so you can scan the QR code or I've got my contact information there. Um, and again, I'll send out some links later um, or through Connie. Um, on our website, we have um, the regional food system assessment. We have the regional food system action plan. Um, we have information um, on how to get involved in implementation. Um, we have all of the data that we collected, including focus group comments available on the web page, um, as well as all of the general information that I shared earlier. 
Um, I know that was a lot of information, but I'm happy to answer any questions and talk about um, kind of uh, where we're going, uh, what the next steps are too. But I'll stop for questions before we jump ahead. Uh, this is Ben Sykes. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I'm, I'm curious about um, how you see sustainability as an element of this. Uh, I see that in the website, and I think you mentioned that as well. And if you could just talk what, what you mean by that or how the vision unfolds for that across the food system plan. Thanks. Yeah, so um, <laughs> sustainable in uh, it's kind of three prongs. So one of them, um, sustainability in terms of um, environmental sustainability. Um, so, um, you know, regenerative practices, um, promoting regenerative or sustainable agriculture, um, climate friendly practices um, is kind of, um, I wouldn't say assumed, <laughs> but uh, it's a it's a value um, that we have for this work um, that it is environmentally um, responsible and that we are good stewards of the earth and that we're building healthy soil and um, you know doing all of that um, sustainability in terms of um, social equity and justice um, knowing that uh, different um, communities encounter um different barriers um so the barriers that folks in rural areas face um to some of these information and resources and markets um are different than what um urban producers are facing um what um black indigenous um and farmers of color are facing is different than what white farmers are facing um so making sure that um it's sustainable in terms um, of equity and justice that um, everyone has access to um, the resources that we're talking about um, and uh, sustainability in terms of um, funding for food systems work, um, economic viability of people's food and farm businesses, um, that um, the work that we're doing in these projects um, you know, are sustainable that they don't just appear for a few years when there's funding and then disappear, um, but having a, a strategic plan for sustainable funding um, to keep the work going over the, the long term. <laughs> Hi, Natalia. Did I get that on? Yeah. Okay. Um, I didn't hear anything about water in all of that. And as I work more and more with uh, different aspects of food policy, I'm seeing that that's kind of the elephant in the room with a lot of conversations about food policy because we have to wash dishes. We have to uh use water in cooking we have to drink water we have to irrigate crops we need water for post-harvest handling worker sanitation um just so many aspects of water and i think we here in the midwest are maybe a little spoiled because we have not had huge restrictions on water um but I guess I'd like to to see the word water show up in context of food security uh, and sustainability a lot more because we may not always be water rich. And then the other concern is that we can plan for our water needs, but people who run out of water first are going to be wanting to tap into what we have so yeah i think you raise a really important point um water conservation was something that came up um 
mostly in terms of supporting regenerative agricultural practices um, and using practices that are um, help producers to be um, more resilient in times of drought. Um, there is a, a little bit of um, a funny issue because with a lot of um, urban farmers, especially if they're um, you know, using land bank properties, a lot of time the water from the city to the, the parcel has been um, disconnected. Um, so we have urban farmers that are struggling to access water um, or pay, um, you know, $10,000 to have the water reconnected to the, the vacant lot that they've purchased to farm. Um, so uh, in some ways, water access is also important. Um, so making sure that farmers have access to water, but that we're all the way through um, production to, to processing, um, that we're emphasizing conservation, I think is a really important point. I'm just curious, this has been again um, about the implementation. So are you guys going for the implementation right now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so about a month ago, um, we started meeting like every couple of weeks um, with people that have indicated um, that they're interested in participating in implementation. Um, and so some of the, um, I don't know if well, Connie has been to some of the meetings. I think Emily's been to some of those meetings. Tyler, I don't know if you've made it to one. Um, Dr. Robert Hicks and um, Ponta. Um, so there's a number of folks from from Douglas County that have participated in. I think we've had two meetings so far. We have another one on Wednesday. Um, right now, we're just kind of in the phase of. Um, well, especially while we were waiting for the. Um, uh, request for applications to come out. Um, just really trying to gauge who's interested in being involved. You know, what capacity do they have? Um, what level do they want to be engaged? Um, and uh, what types of projects would they like to see funded? Um, and understanding, you know, what the limitations of the grant are in terms of who can participate and what projects and costs are allowed. Um, and so we have been meeting. Um, I'm hoping that in the next week or so we can really narrow in on um, who wants to be a partner on the grant um, and, you know, the next tier of like, you know, who's working on the grant, who's a sub awardee, um, where's the, the overlapping um, projects where we can put a solid um, application together. Um, so we've started meeting. It's still really early in that process, um, but we do have um, uh, a due date now. So we know that May 14th is when the grant is due. Um, so we've worked with um, the federal grant writers that we worked with on the planning grant um, back in 2021. Um, we've started working with them again and um, have, you know, have a timeline together. Um, so it'll be a, a quick push from here on out. But um, we've been having really great discussions about um, what potential projects could be funded. And, and there's definitely a lot of overlap in what people are interested in doing all across the region. Um, so I'm pretty optimistic about pulling together a, a good proposal. This is Connie. I have a quick question. So yeah. just for reasons, um, so if food, the Food Policy Council wanted to be part of this RFP, um, then April, they meet again in April 22nd, so they would need to make the vote then before the May 14th deadline, correct? Right? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe 
I can. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to add to that. That means making sure we have a quorum in April. It is reassuring to know that we're not the only uh, food policy coalition that um, doesn't always meet quorum. <laughs> it's a challenge sometimes. One thing that I do see um, kind of coming together. Um, is kind of a regional network of food system planners or coordinators. Um, so there's a lot of restrictions about what this funding um, can go towards. Like you can't purchase land, you can't purchase equipment, um, you can't pay for produ like food production um, costs, but you can, the easiest thing is to support staff time. Um, so, um, funding for farmers market managers, funding for positions like Connie's um, or for, you know, other folks that are doing kind of food system coordinating work um, or planning work. Um, I can see uh, part of the proposal being we have this network of people that are working in these kind of roles throughout the region. Um, and so let's help support their their salaries and their positions, um, and then, you know, meet and work together on the things that we're trying to implement that we share in common. Andrea, are remind me, are you still accepting submissions before Wednesday? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, to everybody listening. If anything sparked in your brain. Um, there's a, you have a chance before Wednesday's meeting to submit something. If you're, um, you know, if you want some help with that, you can reach out to me. Um, and because I've been at a couple meetings and I'm happy to help you out with that as well. Thank you so much, Andrea, for your time and um, working on this project and um, for these opportunities to help get some cool things funded with our our food system here regionally and. Good luck and I'll, I'll see you on the paper sure. Yeah, have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Where's the owl? I know, but I thought the owl from the other place, she just swiped it from the... Uh, yeah, it should have. Sorry. Still trying to figure out technology. All right, I've got two things. One, I'd like to at least remind everyone we want to make room for public comment at the end before we adjourn. So after we do the budgeting room update from staff, I'd like to make room for public comment. If there's anyone who wants to comment. Um, the next thing is I want to introduce, or at least Dietrich. Um, we talked about um, doing some presentation on forwards data and the data collection, and I sent an email to you, but I think I live in an email pit right now. And it's possible it did not reach you. I don't know what you were prepared or if you are prepared to present. It did not reach me. Okay. All right. That's okay. It did not reach me. True. Also, when we met in February, I understood that I was presenting in April. In April. But I could have missed her, but I'm really not prepared right now. I can then we'll then we'll move on. There's no reason that that's that's all it takes. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> um Cool. <laughs> okay. Onward to item four, the City of Lawrence Ordinance 9996 update. Ben, are you ready? Sure. Um, uh, I got Kathy Richardson. It sounds like she was at the last meeting. I was super sick, so I apologize for missing the annual retreat. It looks like I missed awesome stuff. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to provide any um, answer, any questions people have about 9996. Um, if you, you haven't engaged it already, mm -hmm. I would be super surprised that you haven't <laughs> shown up somewhere and expected to get a plastic bag. Um, there was a bag bash on March 2nd that was really well attended and given out in the city. There will be another one um, likely on Earth Day, around the Earth Day events, mm -hmm. and those will continue. Uh, we're encouraging people to, if they have extra bags and they want to donate them, they can get in touch with me or get in touch with Kathy Richardson. Uh, we're collecting those and then we'll redistribute them because, of course, we don't want um, the lack of a bag to be a problem for anybody. Um, we have seen some really cool things. A lot of um, businesses around town are starting to utilize these. Uh, they're making their own reusable bags and distributing them when they give out things. I got one from So Forth, which is over by Munchers, when I got some um, Pants him. They had an awesome bag that they gave me, and it announced an advertisement for me or for them everywhere I go. Um, just you know, there's a, a bunch of so there is still some confusion around what the ordinance is and is not. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I would say the best place for anyone that's confused is to go to the website Plastic Free Lawrence. Um, Plastic Free Lawrence, I believe it's .com. Click on it. Org. Org. It is not profit. So it has all the information there, FAQs, uh, as people are posing those questions to the city, they get answered a few times and Kathy is uploading that question as an FAQ. And it has a bunch of resources for businesses that might be confused. We've had questions of, you know, from individuals that are worried about, you know, picking up dog poop. Uh, to like, uh, are they going to get in trouble if they walk out with a bag? Of course, the answer to both of those is no. Um, this is a, a it's, it's on the businesses to do these things, but there are some great resources there for businesses. And there are plenty of exemptions as well, like the farmer's market and um, religious organizations and the bags that you use to take produce um, from the place you get it in the store to the point of sale, like where you pay for it. Those are all exempt. So anyways, there may be some changes down the road um, over time of what needs to change about the ordinance as we see some things pop up. But right now, that's probably the best place to go is plasticfreelawrence.org um, for all the questions that people have. Yes, Dietrich. Yeah, thank you. I'm curious, are those exemptions eventually going to be swept away over time? It's not obvious to me why the earth knows the difference between a plastic bag used at Dillon's and one used at the farmer's market? That is a great question. Uh, there, as I understand it, there is currently no intention to do that. Um, one of the things that came up that might have some relevance for why we might need to change the ordinance is about um, point of sale liquor. So there is a state mandated law about how you have to to go liquor in a plastic bag. So uh, if you can't do plastic bags, then that. So there's little things like that that are popping up um, that we'll have to adapt to. And maybe over time we start to see that there is, you know, everybody's got reusable bags anyways, and you don't need to necessarily have particular exemptions. So I can bring this back to my team. What, can you give me the background on the exemption for the farmer's market, please? Yeah, so that was actually brought about in the discussion at City Commission. So you may remember that um, there were kind of three different proposals originally, which was a fee on bags, um, this, which was a straight ban, and then an educational program. Um, and when the ban was pushed as kind of the, the suggested one, um, there was a lot of discussion about inadvertent consequences of those kind of things, including equity and, and the farmer's market came up and other things like um, newspapers and bags and things like that. And so that was just one at the time that was um, put forward by one of the city commissioners and one and one of being an element in it. I think most people understood too at the time that the farmer's market is already using very, very few plastic bags and most of the people that go there are using reusable bags anyways. So I don't think it's a huge generator of plastic bags, but it was one of these, what can we worry about uh, unintended consequences at the time? That's my understanding. Thank you. I was, I was like, I've definitely had people be like, we should be not the exemption, but we should be the example. And so I, you know, I think we have some of our own sustainable things, initiatives to work on, but appreciate the background. Um, just coming in from my perspective as a vendor, 
paper bags aren't going to work on a rainy day because we're outdoors. Um, people wouldn't be able to set things down um, on wet ground. And then the other thing is that substantially we are operating like that space between where you pick up your vegetables in the grocery store and where you leave the store because people are picking up from multiple points. Mm -hmm. So that may be some thoughts to help those were, explain. Those are both great points. Thank you. Um, I, was trying, I was trying to think of, yeah, like reasons. And I think, you know, if we can move towards more compostable plastic, um, that would be great eventually. But I love that idea of the rainy day. We are outside. That's a really good point. I had a couple other questions of notes, Ben. Um, what are the consequences if somebody, like if a store is not, is what are the, are those written into this ban as well? Yes, uh, yeah, it is. I really appreciate it, Natalia, you bring that up. That's absolutely right. Those were some of the key points that were raised about it. Um, so again, these are on plasticfreelawrence as well, um, dot org, but, um, if you're found out of violation, first time it's a hundred dollar fine. The second time within the same month is two hundred dollars, and the third time is five hundred dollars. Um, I think as written, that's not like a per bag violation, so it's not it's not like you know you could be in a million dollars kind of debt. <laughs> um, um, there's also an enforcement issue of having um, enforcement officers being able to go out there and, and stuff like that. But this is just like kind of um, noxious weed ordinances and other things like that. This is a complaint based thing. And you raised something else that I just want to address. So we have had a business that bought a bunch of compostable plastic bags. Um, and that's brought up another round of discussions as well, because we certainly don't want to inhibit, for example, if they start making plant-based plastic bags and they're not made from hydrocarbon, they're not made from oil, we don't want to inhibit that by having this ban. So I think there needs to be some discussion about like how if, if the industry transforms and it's not using fossil fuels to create these bags, do we want to, how do we deal with that? Yeah. And I think uh, like forward, that's a great conversation as we like are talking with like compost collective and things mm -hmm. like that, like what they can compost and what they can do. And maybe we can help to influence those kinds of products that will be coming into markets. Is that? No, so no. Saying, the Thank understanding you. is that for it to be compostable, it needs to see the light of day. I mean, if you take a plant-based plastic bag mm -hmm. and shove it into the ground, what happens to it? It organically decomposes. It will decompose. My understanding. It organically, I said. My understanding. My understanding is that there are two categories that kind of get conflated and that there's biodegradable and compostable. And so one thing that came up with uh, Robert Peterson is that he can't deal with the biodegradable bags because those are a 900 day turnaround rather than actually compostable. And so that's where you get into what are the conditions under which it's being composted? Is it anaerobic? Do it, does it have fat? Like any number of things, but there is a distinction to be made between compostable and eventually biodegradable. Clearly a complex, sorry, clearly a complex issue. And, and as that technology develops, but also as the spec uh, specifics of how you have to write that or the distinctions that you're making, Cody, into the code, if we wanted to make allowances for those things, would be really important to get the technical details right. Okay. I have a practical question about policy and ordinances. Um, does any evolution of the ordinance require the full review that got the ordinance to exist, or are there ways of the ordinance? Um, sun, uh, uh, sunsetting some exemptions without needing to go through the full process. My understanding is just like with any ordinance that the city of Lawrence has is that the full city commission would have to vote on it again, at least, yes. but they can vote to simply update the existing ordinance. Okay, I got more questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm trying to do Kathy. Uh, you're, doing, you're doing great. Thank you, Ben, for answering these. I'm like, I understand I can go to the website. I'm like, I have you here. Yeah, yeah, so, um, when, a, okay, I was talking with Alejandro today, who is the owner of Zen Zero and um, Genovese, and I was like, what are you doing with all the bags that you've stockpiled? Right? So, thinking about up until March 1st, or you know, even before this was proposed, 
you're you're a business, you're buying in bulk. Is there any type of program or have you guys thought about this or is or is there something that's happening with businesses that they have plans? Do you guys is that is that a thought about? Yeah, I think um there is some discussion about that on the website. Um I think it's not as promising for people like him as it is for chain stores, for example, that will just shift their bags to some municipality or some county that doesn't have these bans. Um, I think it's a, a, a tricky aspect as well for planning ahead. I, I think, um, you know, Kathy and others in um, the city staff started talking to businesses la uh, late last year, but you know, there was a lot of uncertainty. There still is a lot of uncertainty created by the legislature around some of the um, uh, legislation like the, yeah, that it's going through. So um, people didn't really know if they needed to plan around it. And um, now that it's in effect, you know, I think for the consumers there, most of them are just dealing with it how they have to, but for businesses that might have, you know, a thousand dollars worth of plastic bag inventory or something like that, it's a big thing. So. That, that may be something that um, can be addressed collectively too. Maybe that's something to come, like just like Earth Day is coming with a lot of reusable bags to distribute to the public. Maybe there's something that can be done positively with all of these plastic bag inventories for local businesses. Okay, last question I wrote down was, where are you redistributing these bags to? Do you guys have a plan for that? Or the plastic ones? The reusable ones that you and Kathy are collecting. Oh yeah, so at the bag bash, um, yeah, it's it's kind of first come first serve for people that have brought them. Um, at the bag bash, people could also uh, there was a ton of people that showed up at the library. It was also when I was super sick, so but um, you could design your own bag and do lots of stuff. And so um, I don't know if there will be some kind of a co-op or collective where all extra reusable bags go and people can pick them up as they need to. Um, I don't know if that's in the future, but right now we just want to keep punctuating opportunities for people to come and get them as they can. And um, I think Kathy is the great, the best point of contact for that right now. Sorry, Kathy, if you're listening, I don't know if you Your house is going to be full of reusable bags. Uh, mine, was, so I was going to say what mine was until really recently, we just brought them all to the farmer's market and people just took them all. And that was great. So if Kathy, you're listening, if you need a place, just drop them off. We'll store them in the trailer and give them out to free people easily. That sounds like a really good opportunity to keep a, you know, rolling, especially during warm months. Like, a, hey, if yeah. you need a reusable bag, go to the farm. Yeah. I was just going to add, I hadn't been following the, um, the current legislature and what the current state of the ban on bans is. As I understand it, the current state of the ban on bans, uh, ban on um, plastics and other kinds of utensils like that has been passed by the House. It has not um, been taken up and made it out of committee in the Senate yet. It was brought to the Committee on Commerce at the very end of January. Um, and if it goes forward there, um, then the, uh, it would go to the full Senate and then the governor would have you know, per se. That is my current wish. Has the governor given her impressions? I do not speak with her. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I, I don't actually. She she um, threatened the veto the last time that they did this, but um, she also, you know, you all know legislation more. There's a lot of complex legislative issues that are up. Mm -hmm. So who knows? I, I don't know. All we can do is go forward day by day, uh, trying to institute it as we have within the city. I'll also add that um, my understanding is that some of our ethnic food retailers might be struggling with the bag ban and the exemptions and what counts and what doesn't. And so another place, another point of contact for extra bags to help encourage one contact with your life. We can help walk you through these things. And also if you need extra bags or if you need your um, customers to have access to extra bags, that might be another place for pickup and distribution. Yeah, so that raises two really good points. Uh, resource for businesses about how they can get redistributed back. If people are, are, if the city is going to distribute them, maybe they can go through those businesses. And also resources for them to, if they want to make branded reusable bags that they wanted to do, like how do they do that? Who are some, how are other people in the city or in the region doing that? That's great points, thank you. The other side of that is amnesty for people with big stashes of 
disposable bags and we might connect with the Humane Society. They want to give those out to folks to use for blue bags. Thank you so much, Ben. Anybody else before we move on? That was great to learn a little bit more. Um, all right, we're gonna move on. Natalia, are you ready? We're gonna hear um, Natalia has created a water working group and is going to give us, um, as the chair, a working group update. I'll ramble a little bit as Natalia is preparing some papers here. Um, I didn't have anything actually to ramble about. <laughs> Um, this is my third public meeting today. At least this one is some uh, lived experience compensation. The rest was all free. Um, so this is a map that I discovered online. So oh, here's my copy. Um, this map was done in 2002. And there's some white areas at the bottom left and the bottom right. And then up around the river, south of the river, and north of the river in North Lawrence that are white. And these areas comprise by square miles, 12% of the county, roughly. Those areas do not have any service, or in 2002 did not, were not served by a rural water district or other public water source. So if water in the wells of people that live and work in these areas becomes contaminated or the wells lose water, um, those folks don't have other good options to have drinking water, irrigation water, livestock water, industrial process water, whatever water needs to be used for. And just in the last six months, we've seen like eight or some different public approval processes happening at the Douglas County level that have been changes in land use, intensifications of land use, um, site plans, rezonings. Um, and of course, the commercial scale solar and the new Boston Crossing, uh, both of those are in or near areas that don't have alternative water access. Um, and so these, what I'm noticing is that they, requ they require stormwater management and drainage studies and stuff like that, but nobody's looking at the groundwater. The only way groundwater, the only way water is addressed in most of these staff reports that I've seen has been a line on the, on the site plan that says it's on city water or it's on rural water or water is from a well. But there's nothing that's looking at how that development and change will affect the groundwater at that site or potentially at surrounding areas. One, one bit of bad planning in allowing a use that may contaminate an aquifer could put many, many square miles 
uh, not having access to well water that's safe. Um, and just the, the couple square miles, not even that, uh, around my farm, there are 25 or more homes that are very, very vulnerable in terms of water contamination. We have very shallow aquifer. We're starting, we've had several or in the middle of several development changes, use changes that will put more pressure on the aquifer, more chance of it being contaminated. And so I would like to, uh, you know, with the Food Policy Council support, I would like to ask the County Commission to initiate some studies of, you know, like start with updating this map. And in addition to what areas are served, then how many people or businesses or farms that need water, how many water users are in those areas? In the areas that have rural water, how, are there still places that rely on well water because it would be too expensive for them to connect to rural water? Um, and then how do we include a focused look at groundwater impact in our evaluation process for all types of planning within the county? Because we have, we have such a good focus on soil now, but soil without water is not very usable for high value agriculture. Uh, so then I guess down the line, we also need to look at there's, you know, if we have water, there's gonna be more and more people that don't, that are gonna want our water. And how do we manage water resources in Douglas County to keep those in the county and not being piped far away. So, um, it's, I'm not sure how to start the process, how we make a suggestion to the county commission of, you know, what we would want them to undertake. You know, updating this map is not a volunteer job. I do it if they pay me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, no, no any, any conversation? Maybe we can have a meeting with uh, leadership um, and organize that and uh, have it to a vote for the FPC, one of the community plans. So have a more concrete ask for the FPC to advance. Okay. Second I was gonna say in the meantime, have you talked to any like community partners, potentially like Florence Douglas County Public Health or other conservation groups that might be interested in that kind of study as well? Uh, like if there's more in the room, um, and more support from other organizations that might have a heavier lift with the commission. Yeah, I, I've actually been so busy reviewing and commenting on planning documents mm -hmm. that I've not had very much time to yeah. reach out, but I, I appreciate that suggestion very much. Yeah, between the, the conservation district, the watershed management, um, and another consideration that as you talk about this, that is also going to come up is You've been talking a lot about water as an input, but water as an output is also a concern. And so there's been an ongoing problem, particularly uh, uh, with PFAS con concentration and wastewater uh, products. So wastewater products eventually can make their way to soil amendments. But the problem is as anyway, water can help mi PFAS migrate and that wall that can build up also in the ground 
and then again be a source of groundwater contamination. And so that might also be a way of approaching the commission and going, there not only is access to water, but the condition of the water and the long-term consequences might be another angle yeah. that we can approach. Okay. Yes. As a general point, we as Blue Policy Council, can we make requests of staff to complete a study, update a study, expand the study? Okay. I would guess, sorry, this is just speaking as a sustainability advisory board chair. We can't, uh, for our board, we can't ask city staff to do anything. We can ask, we can recommend that city commission ask city staff to do things. I would assume that that is the same thing for this county planning commission. Yeah, yeah, basically the same thing that we're facing with the food truck ordinances. Now, I will say city staff has been extremely helpful in the process, but ultimately, yes, the commission has to be the person who drives the staff to do anything. Is it appropriate for us to approach commission, city, county, to make that request that a study be done, conducted by staff, or are we pushing our luck and annoying people? I mean, I think that's part of our role as an advisory board to the commission. I mean, I think that in my understanding, that's what our job is for them, is to elevate those things. My, just a thought off the top of my head, Natalia, would be to like have a clear ask, which is like, sounds like, you know, update this map and then individually talk to each county commissioner. I love Tyler's idea of coming with multiple part other partner ideas, and maybe that's something that like um, we can help kind of generate ideas of who all might be invested in this, um, and then go talk to each county commissioner and kind of just update them on what you're doing. Because if you individually talk to them, you'll have great, I don't know, usually have pretty great uh, conversations that can you know can go a little bit further, and so then. Um, and then um, we as Food Policy Council then can maybe come with a letter of support. I'm trying to think of how that, that process then would work. On I top think of the first step would be to meet with leadership and figure out um, what you want to specifically work on. Because as an appointed board member, you're serving the county. So you want to make sure that the board is also has the full thumbs up to the work that you're doing, especially if it's in policy. And then you can individually meet with um, whichever representative you prefer, but definitely meet individually or with just so they don't hit their form. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm very sensitive to that. I think another obvious point that we can also work towards is integrating water explicitly into the next food system plan. Right. I was just going to say, I was trying to find it on, on my phone, but like where in the existing food system plan is yeah. water addressed? I think it's like it's goal two, objective two, yeah. conserve, conserve soil and water resources. Yeah. Is, is this um, piece of paper that you handed out just the priorities? Is this online somewhere that I can access so I can, I have somebody who's interested in joining your working group, so I want to pass this to them I, or just email it to me if, if it's not. I, it's in Word. I can attach it to an email. Yeah, I wrote it at five o'clock. <laughs> Looks great. I was like, I, just, I have a friend who wants to join your working group. So awesome. Awesome. We'll pass that along. Great. May I follow up on Cody's point about other agencies who have this in their mission? So could you repeat the list and then elaborate a little bit? Sure. So um, there are, there is the, thank you. There is the, let's see, the conservation district, but I need to remember. So I get these confused because there is the watershed, there are the watershed districts for the Wakarusa, um, for the Kaw, and then there is the conservation district, but these things are separate. Um, that said, there is someone on the open space plan who is part of the Wakarusa watershed management. And so that's something I can also approach that person and say, we have this ask. Who can we approach? But that is, honestly, it is a little bit um, mixed up in my head in the word salad, in the salad of organizations and acronyms. Yeah. 
And so I'm going to have to go chase them out and go, this is exactly what I meant. But there are there. There are districts specifically for the watershed and what affects the tributaries of each water system, and that would be one of the many places we could go. I would imagine for. <laughs> I would imagine for groundwater, the. Division of water resources embedded within the Kansas Department of Agriculture and has the final say on how water rights are allocated. And coming to Talia's point about how do you protect the existing developments access to water? That's this thing. We have a senior seniority right system so that the junior water right holder would have to cease using the water until the senior water right is made whole. Now, that's never been attempted um, in the state of Kansas. So, but technically, it's there. Yeah. The big catch with that is that it does not, it totally exempts residential uses and uh, even market garden uses yeah. would not be necessarily covered by that set of regulations. So it, it gets more confusing than you think it might. <laughs> I just had one other comment after you have this leadership meeting and you know that, you know, the FBC has prioritized this. I mean, I'm just looking under the key that I'm guessing that the GIS division where um, Ken Walker Wilson was a cartographer might not exist uh, or anymore. Uh, I don't know if there's still a county engineer, um, but one option would be those kind of people within the county and then I would be surprised. You, you could probably get the universities involved. Yeah, K State uh, or Kansas Geological Survey. Yeah, yes. and I mean, they would probably have well, 10 times better map than that. They have to publish water maps every year. So does the USGS. I know. So, I mean, you need to probably, probably need your whole map. One of the things that I found is that there's a database that all wells are supposed to be entered in and just in my neighborhood there's an incredibly tiny fraction of the actual existing wells are on that there are a lot of unpermitted wells out there there are a lot of wells that were put in before any of this happened um, so it, it's going to be difficult to find that information about who is at risk of losing water if the water is contaminated. Um, the, the current county engineer for Douglas County came back to Douglas County from the Division of Water Resources is my understanding. So he is very knowledgeable and and known as kind of the authority on all the water everywhere in Douglas County. Um, so I will be working with him on this more planning aspect of things when I'm done wading through all of the. You see, he does studies for the planning studies for site plans and stuff like that. So yeah, it's just all very chaotic right now. Um, I don't know if we're in the agenda to ask this. Um, there are these deep Association of Rural Water Districts is meeting next week in Wichita. It's a three day meeting. There's only one day that I think I would be able and want to go to. Um, is there a way to do that through the Food Policy Council for travel expenses and registration? That would be. Um reach out to Connie and yeah. ask for the form. Okay. Um, we would have to vote on it, which we don't have which one we today, can't. we can't. So if that's next week, we won't be able to vote yeah. before then. 
Okay. Tony, can we retroactively mm -hmm. fund something? That's a really good question. I don't know, but I don't see why not. Because it's a reimbursement anyway, right? You can vote on it maybe next meeting. I'll ask him to double check. Yeah, Connie have, will have a form that for you to fill out um, with a request for that. So she email Connie about that and then we'll do our best to get you there. Okay. Or, or reimburse me, reimburse you if you can. Um, also, I was just kind of writing down some things of like working in group potential people as well for this. Um, and I'll email you that idea. But I think, I don't know how, how you feel about this, either writing a letter or like coming to the farmer, Morris Farmers Market board. And like presenting about this because, or if you if you want to, you can use me as a liaison for it. But I feel like the Pendletons have a big stake in this. Scotty Thelman has a big stake in this, and might really be interested in helping out, and maybe some other um, similar people that are, are are those. I know those people we've talked water rights um, together about that. So I think there's some um, great people you can have in your corner on that on that working group as well. All right, with that, um, we're gonna move forward on to food business startup panel discussion and resource fair reflections. Um, back on February 13th, the Food and Farm and Economic Development Working Groups hosted the food business startup panel discussion and resource fair with the support of the Haskell Indian Nations University USDA Extension Office and the Douglas County K-State Research and Extension Office. Um, just a quick couple things about that. We had six different people on our panel and then 10 uh, resources provided. Um, how we ran this event was we um, had kind of a celebrity foodie mark, um, moderator out um, to kind of lead this through. Um, and on our panel, um, we have, let me see if I have this easily, um, we had Josh Zeck, who's a KDA inspector, and Lisa Lakeham Jones um, with the Kansas Department of Revenue. We had Brian Eady from Eady Insurance, or an insurance rep who often like um, represents food, food businesses and things like that. Um, and then Brian Severns, um, the Food Innovation Accelerator at K State Olathe to talk over food safety. Um, we had Christopher King, the prevention chief at uh, Douglas County, Lawrence Douglas County Fire Department. And then um, Mindy Andrasevitz, um, the city of Lawrence, I'm sorry, the city of Eudora fire chief as well. So um, on our panel discussion, we kind of tried to, we tried to round out kind of thinking about if you're a food business startup, what are the things that you're maybe not thinking about or you're, you know, you're needing to do. So we, you know, we were like, okay, you need tax, you need to know about your taxes, you need to know about your insurance, you need to know food safety, and then um, and fire safety and things like that. Am I missing anybody? And then um, food inspector. And I think one of my favorite things about the panel was that. At one point they started talking to each other like they had some conflicts that they saw and i think all of us there were like okay great to see this isn't very clear um and, and all of these little teeny things aren't clear even to these experts um and then in our we so we also then had um so how our event ran was um the first 30 minutes was a resource fair for people to kind of just mingle about with each other or with we had tables around the whole outside edge of it and um, at the, we had available was KU Small Business Development Center, um, One Million Cups, um, which is a uh, entrepreneurial nonprofit. Um, and then we had, did we have Core? Core, Core was there, which is another nonprofit entrepreneurial step different. I don't know enough about them. Uh, Mid America Bank, which does a lot of like loans mm -hmm. to food businesses specifically. Um, we had uh, the uh, Culinary Commons, which is a commercial kitchen space. We had From the Land of Kansas, uh, Shop Kansas Farms, KDA Direct Marketing, Lawrence Farmers Market, and Cotton's Farmers Market, which are all um, marketing um, places for food businesses specifically. And so we had um, that available as the first 30 minutes. 
and then we transitioned into um, a panel discussion um, and then we transitioned back to a resource fair and kind of mainly at the end. Um, we had about 25 people in attendance, um, ranging from people who are, have an idea in their head, maybe just have some capital, to people who have been, come, for me, I knew for sure, coming to farmer's markets for 20 plus years. And so to me, they are like a food expert, but they still wanted a little bit of advice. And I know that they learned something. And, and um, we heard from everybody at that event that, you know, this was very helpful. That I think everybody learned a little something. And even if I saw, you know, at the end, everybody just like ran up to all the panel discussion people and we're just talking to them. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Tyler, do you have any more, more reflections you want to share? No, I think you covered it really well. Um, I think it was just an excellent opportunity to engage while well, a small group <laughs> uh, that they then can take that information out and share it with others that are working on starting their own food business as well. So this is just a small step in something that we see as maybe an annual event for the Food Policy Council to put on and then um, bring in some other concepts like starting a business plan, uh, finding gap financing, finding primary financing, et cetera. So uh all in all it, for our first time event it went off really really well yeah we put we put a lot of work into that um and we were pretty i think we were pretty pretty pleased with it we also had um a local food caterer local food caterer provided and we also had a table with like a couple other extra resources available like cards and things like that like um the chop shop just Foods chop shop had like their information there um and uh, yeah, I think we've all decided, I know we wanna do some, we'd like to do something maybe twice a year, but realistically that's not gonna happen with um, just how the season works. Um, but uh, we will definitely plan another one for hopefully January. I think that's, that's our goal. Um, so if anybody has any questions or feedback or advice for what we should be doing, um, also let us know that. Go ahead, Dietrich. I think it's fantastic, well done. Based on the list Emily that you gave, these are people who, for whom it was not a heavy lift. These are issues that they probably could have spoken on off the cuff. Is that an accurate assessment? Yeah, I think I think so. Yeah, you mean the panelists specifically? Panelists, the people providing oh, information, yeah. guidance, and stuff. Yeah, this was within their wheelhouse. One hundred percent. These are people who, yeah, this is this is their thing. All right. I'm curious, can this generalize? I mean, so impressed with it. I mean, would there be equivalent activities, events that's coming from the Food Policy Council on other issues? I'm thinking of the great work that Tyler, Ryan, um, and we did now with the restaurants. I mean, it wasn't, we were very poor at securing people to participate in a pilot. Um, but I'm going to guess that people would be willing to share their insight about how they manage food waste, how they're trying to deal with it. I mean, even just the basic things like the to-go container being offered, certainly from our stand that our PG and the Chinese Tavern, that's protocol. Everybody gets offered a to-go container if they have food left over on the plate. But I don't know if that generalizes. Did I understand you correctly that you're wondering if this kind of uh, style of an event that we ran could be run for other things like for compost and food waste. And yep. definitely, uh, I mean, I mean I, and I think we would be happy to like help um, share what we learned and, and who, who to talk to and how to, how to coordinate all that. It took a lot of coordination and it was like, at the, towards the end, it was like constant um, and uh, it, but I think it's it was really it was really great and, um, and I, I hope we can keep doing it. I know that like the man who came Brian who came to us from K State's um, their food innovation lab, which is out over in Olathe, which is massive, and they have huge commercial kitchens. He I know took took what we did back, and he wants to run something similar there, which is real was really great to hear. Tyler, would you mind commenting? Since you were, well, you were party to the RPG, and, and we, you and Ryan will be the most thoughtful, engaging with. Yeah, I would say, you know, depending on the group that you're speaking with, 
it's always a challenge, like when's the best time to engage those folks? Um, for instance, I felt like this was a, an event that caught a lot of people at a good time for their schedules. It was after business, normal business hours. Um, you always have to factor in that there's going to be some no-shows, which in this case, I think we had almost 50 sign up, but only 25 were able to make it. So I still see that as successful, especially for a first-time event. I wouldn't be surprised if that number goes up considerably as we do this on a regular basis. Um, so with restaurants, for instance, the hardest thing is finding the time to do it. I would say if you're going to look at something like that to coordinate with Lawrence Restaurant Association and try to get them like, on their annual meeting, um, and have that maybe be a section of it, or they would be able to kind of advise on the best time to catch or capture the most people. Because that's another thing too, is like, you have to consider your capacity and what your time value putting into this is. Is it worth when five people show up or is it worth when 25 people show up? <laughs> Get five main counties in the room. I mean, there's other institutions that provide a fair amount of food here in Douglas County. I mean, could it be that we have people who are operating the various school cafeterias, Lawrence, Eudora, Milton, and whatever, I mean, that speak to their trials and tribulations? I mean, certainly when I was out at Free State High School, there were some horror stories of <laughs> the people who, and the students who are food free and reduced lunch are required to take a fruit. Or if they get a particular entree, they have to get a piece of fruit. And the students would look at the person who gave them and forced them the piece of fruit, look them in the eye, pull the apple over the trash can, and drop it in. Um, so I just wonder if there were like stories, you look at the in Battle Woods, if people could share with this type of thing. I think that would be a great group to talk with. Um, yeah, I think that would be that's one thing we talked about. It. Uh, Haskell's food waste, um, our recycling program went to a trash program and we just revitalized that through the extension office. Um, and so because of leadership changes out there, uh, we don't really have a food waste program at, at the cafeteria. So we're bringing in a new contractor to actually do our food now. And that's part of that contract. So I would, I would be very interested in, like you said, having some panels that discuss these things and bring in people maybe that have had success or failures because we can learn from those as well. And just so you guys know, uh, our extension office would be glad to sponsor you. So. <laughs> All right. One I nice like to remember in my mind to always think of too is like on the Douglas County level. So if you look at universities or you're looking at um, school systems, try to like bring in Eudora, Wilcompton, um, Baldwin City and Baker. And rest of the yeah. Yeah. We should also look at private schools. Um, and I'm thinking particularly that some years back, St. John's Catholic School had like got a grant to do a food waste reduction program. And they did some amazing, amazing things there. I don't know if they're still doing it or not, but it's been quite a few years. Uh, I would definitely reach out to them, yeah. anybody that's doing stuff with food waste. But uh, private schools may have uh, more latitude to do innovative things and then to get those people at the table with the public schools and institutions could really uh, foster some, some good inspiration there. We, we've been in conversation with St. John's and they have a donate um, system, at least in the elementary school, where if you, right, if you were given the apple, you're not going to eat the apple. You can donate it to this particular platter. That's a great idea, Natalia. Thank you, Taylor. And thank you, Maggie. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. We're going to move on. Um, now we're going to hear an update from um, the Kansas Food Action Network Advocacy Day that was on March 7th. Um, I, Cody and Connie both attended this year, as well as Ponce Leon um, from the RUSD 497 Farm School. Uh, I'll let you guys take it away. Liberals, as you guys share them. Cody, first. 
Uh, I'll start with a brief overview of what the advocacy day is like. And then obviously, if I forget anything, you will probably help me out. Um, I was a little nervous about the advocacy day. I was like, I'm not, I'm not policy wonky. I don't know like, uh, how, much, how much are we going to get into this? Um, but it's it's pretty nice. We got we we come to the Capitol. We this time we met at the Kansas Health Institute, um, which is a beautiful building, uh, and we were fed breakfast. And then they K fan did a little introduction, did a little icebreaker. We all introduced ourselves, and then they had their lobbyist come in and say, "Here's what the temperature like is on the Capitol. Here's what's going on." Um, this time coming in because we where we met in the session, we couldn't they couldn't bring anything we talked to our legislators about. They couldn't bring up new business. So there is a little bit of a um, when does KFAN do this do this convening? Um, another thing that we sort of discovered later on is because we all have different representatives and um, senators who are on different committees. Sometimes our particular interests don't overlap immediately with which committees they're on. So another thing that we might turn to KFAN as saying maybe mix and match with some of our regional um, other food system specialists who like, okay, somebody from Cedric County had someone who actually needs to talk to Christina Haswick or something. Um, but it was it was very worthwhile. Um, Honey and Panda and I made sure we also took photos with everybody to say we have evidence that we were there. <laughs> Um, there was also a little bit, they definitely, all of our re representatives were ready to help, but they also really want specific asks. They want, they want to know like what specifically, and so a lot of what this meeting was because we didn't come with specific asks, which is another thing that we could also work with the food policy councils going, what are we taking to them specifically? Um, this time I simply said, look, we're trying to get in front of your faces so you know when we come to you next, what, who we are and that we mean it. Um, another thing that did also come up is KFAN this time, the legislative priorities came out at such a time where none of us were really prepared to bring like the legislative priorities to our representatives. So we also want to turn to KFAN about getting KFAN legislative priorities out earlier so that we're all prepared and all on the same wavelength, so to speak. Ani, did I miss anything? Um, yeah, I think like from an administrator perspective on the last point that you made, I, I would also recommend KFAN to start the legislative priorities earlier because as a, a government appointed board, um, you can only speak of what the commission approved for the Douglas County legislative priorities. And when the FPC approved the Food Council's recommendations, it was before KFAN completed there, so we didn't get the language that we needed into the KFAN legislative priority. So I think timing is really important. I know in the past we have been able to have everything, you know, KFAN first, now FPC first, then KFAN. That way, FPC, this FPC influences KFAN, and then Douglas County, and then comes Advocacy Day. So ideally, everything's aligned. And yeah, it's. Who's keeping track of all this? <laughs> right. Um, I, I'm trying to keep a better track of it, but it makes sense because KFAN is the Kansas Food Action Network, convenes over 30 plus food policy councils across the state. So they would largely benefit from getting their legislative priorities um, aligned with other food councils. So we are all, you know, advocating for a really big win on equitable food systems. But keep that timeline next year. Really and for perspective, I think this is only the third advocacy day that KPEN has done. So I think as we do more of these, Sorry, I think you're it's right, a third. You're right, you're right. No, no, no. Well, anyway, uh, so as we do more of these, ideally we can talk to KFAN and be like, okay, here's what worked, here's what we need for the next one. And also I will encourage you next year to come along. Um, it really was worthwhile, not scary, and um, you will know the Capitol building by the end of it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah.
you'll you'll have discovered parts of the Capitol <laughs> building. <laughs> I'm just wondering, you know, the two things that you said seem like there's also opportunity there for overlap. So if you come up with a legislative priority, taking a shot in the forum, shot in the dark, at which committee that might come before would be wise because then you can say, oh, that's Douglas County rep or mm -hmm. that's not Douglas County rep. And so we can field the legislative priority that's super important to, you know, some other food policy council or something because our rep is on it. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what I mean? Like putting those two pieces together, it seems really wise. Right. And I think another part of that is hoping that if we can get more representatives from each region, then we can send essentially a mixed contingent to each rep and be like, okay, here is your point person. This is your, this is your Douglas, this like, we're taking someone from Douglas County to go meet with Marcy Francisco. But in addition, that person has a tag along from Stainline County. Yeah. I'm curious. I'm curious. Do these great people like Marcy Francisco and Mike Yamricks, do, do they commonly receive Douglas County constituents such as us that are trying to be thoughtful citizens? I mean, was this once again a big ask or was this standard procedure? I didn't go this year, but I went the previous two years and I will say that it's an easy ask. It's a slam dunk. I don't know how you feel that. They're usually pretty on board with things already. I would say yes. I would also say it was a humbling experience and the fact that they are at that time when we met are so exhausted by hearing from people. They're like, you have two minutes of my attention. You better be on it. Otherwise, <laughs> it's just blah. Yeah, two minutes is still worth the drive. Mm -hmm. would, would Marcy or or Mike say, listen, I'm not on that committee, but I know, I mean, I know somebody who's on that committee. Let me put your communication with that person. Not so much. Or... I would say we were a little more proactive. No, maybe not that day, mm -hmm. but if we maybe reached out earlier, that could be a possibility. I think, it, again, it all comes down to the timing. And we, I don't know if you felt rushed on the day you went, like it was just like a lot of information and stuff. And then you're like, okay, let's go. <laughs> uh, it did feel a little high speed. Um, there was a mix. So Christina Haswood was in in a meeting and we and so that one felt tight. But then Tom Holland said, OK, you know what? I've got a meeting. Can you meet me again in 10 minutes and you can have 25 minutes of my time? Wow. So it really there is a little bit of a, a crapshoot of how much time and energy they have to give you. But because in, in this particular instance, because Cape Ann does the like reaching out and organizing, it feels so easy to just go. Go do it. Um, I didn't get the impression from them this time that they'd been exhausted by people reaching out to them. Um, so I'd say it's a bet that, like you said, even two minutes, go take it. Um, and they all were excited that we, they all seemed excited we were there. Um, and honestly, all of them were excited about some of the things that we were already working on and letting them know that we were putting the groundwork in for. Uh, Marcy Francisco is very on board about food waste reduction. Mm -hmm. oh. Extremely on board. Okay. Yeah. Connie, anything else you can think of? Yeah, I, I just want to reiterate to everybody, it's if you're able to go one day, please um, try to make it a priority one time, even if it's something that we like can help maybe get some funds to help get you there if that's what's needed. Um, it it really was a great experience and it makes you go, oh, the policy we're doing has real impact. I'm in the Capitol talking to our senators and representatives. And um, it really kind of solidifies and brings home the, some of the stuff that we're working on. Um, and you get to build those relationships up. Uh, yeah, so it ended up that Christina has with once we don't even know working group. So yeah, that was pretty cool. Well, and I know that Christina Haswood is running for the same seat as Marcy Francisco, so maybe Marcy would be interested as well. I don't know. Maybe I think she wants to go up. But we also really, I don't know how, I mean, we will lose Tom Holland this year, just be aware of that. Um, 
I know for sure. But yeah, I know. Yeah, Christina is going for Senate a Senate seat seat this year. Tom might you might be able to court him for Eco Devo. Mm. He he does own two other businesses and is very yeah. deeply busy with that right now. That's what we'll say that. Um, yeah. But you can also, if you ever want to talk to him, he's at the farmers market every week on Saturday, and Marcy Francisco is there almost every week as well. I'm going to the House Water Committee tomorrow. I'm not providing testimony, but I'm supporting two people who are providing testimony. Do I have? If I start talking to somebody about food waste prevention, do I have to acknowledge that I'm on the Food Policy Council? Should I not announce that? I just know you cannot lobby. Yeah. I just know you cannot lobby. I think you can. I think you could say you're a member of, but you can't. You can say you're a member. I think you can talk lobbying. This one's hard. Um, you can't tell them. You can't encourage them which way to vote. That's lobbying. Um, you can tell them what we're working on. And you can give them data, but you can't essentially when it comes to lobbying, you certainly can't tell them which way to vote. And I think there are some circumstances in which even encouraging them to vote on a specific thing also counts as lobbying. Um, I'll see if I have some resources from the Johns Hopkins group about what specifically constitutes lobbying. But yes, because you're a representative of the Food Policy Council, lobbying is not, we are not to lobby because we are a government organization. I'm sure KU has the same restrictions. But what um, I don't know is it, but what I don't know if, if I can share, so it sounds like I can share data. That is, we formed pilot projects, this is the insight we gleaned. Right, that's that's acceptable. As far as I understand, yes, you can say this is what we're working on. This is what we're doing. So it's a policy wonk, right. true policy wonk. Um, <laughs> me, can I say that these type of results would support this type of policy? No, I think I think for this instance, I would say these are the results I see. But I think the link. To like this, which means do this policy. I think you have to sort of. This is where you encourage them to like make the leap themselves, but you can't. Trying to make that leap for them, I think, counts. I will say that's yeah. the last paragraph in every study I publish. Mm. <laughs> it's well, a hard one because we have to. If if you're talking to your percentages, then. You have to follow the Douglas County. If you have your FPC hat on, you have to follow the Douglas County legislative priorities. Um, unless you're just talking about what you are doing as a food policy council member, period. But if you go into policy, then that goes into getting in the timeline to getting on the legislative priorities. Yeah, even. So I know when Emily and uh, I went, we were advocating for the sales tax being eliminated. Even though that was a legislative priority, we still could not say we wanted to vote in favor or whatnot. We still had to be neutralish on that level. Advocacy versus yeah. Thank you. One more. This, I guess, brings up a question for me as to because I am planning on speaking on a number of public hearing items with Douglas County Commission. Is it sufficient that I just clearly identify that I am speaking as a property owner within the notification district and that? This has nothing to do with Food Policy Council. As far as I understand, yes, this doesn't like obviate your ability to be a citizen or farmer. I think it's when you lean on, I'm a member of Douglas Food Policy Council, that's when you go, okay, the Douglas County Food Policy Council. So you say, here are the things that I see as a landowner, as a farm operator. And then if we, as the Food Policy Council or leadership, we've said, here's a letter of support, or here are the things we're working on, then you kind of have to silo it. But it doesn't, I don't think you can't participate in full candor. It's just a matter of when do you 
said, when you announced the Douglas Food Policy Council had. Yeah, and <clears throat> maybe clearly announcing that I'm taking that hat off yeah. mm -hmm. to speak. It, it just gets, it's, yeah, it gets tricky and navigate the best you can. That's okay. all I'm going to say. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, with that, um, thank you, everybody. It's been a really great meeting. Um, let's do budget and grant update. Connie. We do have quorum, so okay. I'm going to skip the budget request vote. Um, but I think Kobe and Emily can update you next month. Um, yeah. um, but uh, I, on behalf of FPC, apply for the HCC grant for the Indigenous Food System Study and Action Plan um, to hire the experts to lead that work. And Mackie with the USDA Extension Office um, also provided a letter of support for that grant. Um, in the past, the FPC has, not the FPC, the Sustainability Office um, has applied for an HCC grant. Um, so that's why I applied for it. But it might, just a heads up, it might get pulled out of the grant if it is not approved by the county commissioners. Um, because it's a county program applying for county funds. Can you tell us what HDC stands for? I can't honestly. Heritage Conservation Council. That's it. Yes. <laughs> um, so I it's on the agenda for this Wednesday, so I guess we will know if it gets to stay on the grant or not this Wednesday. But if it is not, then I plan to ask the commissioners for a general fund request. Great. Thanks, Tommy. I'm going to ask you a question. What's that grant for? 65. And I can share a copy of the full grant to all FPC members if you like. I mean, can we just confirm that's 6,500, two zeros, right? 65,000? 65,000? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, and with that, we're going to move to public comment. I see we have two people online. We lost our in-person person. Anybody online, you have three minutes each. If you have any questions, comments, no worries if you don't. Let us know, please. Jasmine, if you have anything you want to add or ask, please open. Okay. I'm curious why the person who came for public comment left. Was it because we threw a curveball? She was expecting to provide public comments at the beginning? Did you know that person, Tom? I did. They also work with PCS. Okay. Okay. Oh. They might have just been wanting to see what we were about. Mm -hmm. Okay. They we did not applied. scare them off. And they had applied for it. Okay. okay. We moved a short period. I don't know if this helps, but for SAP, we moved a short period like City Commission has a public comment at the beginning, mm -hmm. but it's limited to like five. Mm -hmm. And then if we had more public comment, which we never do, we could address it. At the yeah, end, yeah, just yeah, so they really don't have to. That's a good idea. All right, and I'm not hearing from anybody. So with that, we're going to go ahead. Mackie's got one more thing. Go. Okay. I got two things, but <laughs> uh, one thing I just wanted to uh, mention was that um, Jasmine had went with our ABLE group to uh, Las Vegas last week, and uh, they uh, competed in a uh, business plan competition and got third place. Very cool. Uh, up, right, up, up cycle business and fluid. And so uh, we've been seeing them work on that uh, tirelessly for the past month or so. And um, they did good. So uh, really proud of them. Um, so that, that was my good stuff. 
the other concern I have that I wanted to bring to you guys is um, I met with um, the Common Grounds with um, Umet, right? And um, she expressed me um, some concern about the future of that program. And I find that very disturbing, um, as we said, talk about accessibility to food and um, farming and, and, and the accessibility that it plays into it. Um, I have set up a meeting with some folks from the county um, to figure out how Haskell, Haskell Extension and Haskell as a whole, because I have more than Extension, I also have Native American Agricultural Funds uh, funding for the next two years to find out how we can um, build that program, community-based ones. And uh, so bringing this to your guys' knowledge as, as the Food Policy Council that um, I'm not sure how we as a group can support it. I think there's some of the studies that things that fits into that. Um, but also at the same time, uh, I think it's important for us to make sure the county knows how important this program is. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think all of them see it. And so that's what I'm going to ask the leadership as I meet with them um, in the next week or two. Um, I might meet with uh, one of one person and then um, I'll step it up from there. But um, what I'm thinking and, and I'm proposing is is something with the county as a whole so that I can help this committee, this this with funding, but also uh, common grounds and, and kind of any other projects that the county is doing. So um, like it will probably step it up to an MOU situation where mm -hmm. there's more of a, a, a <laughs> I don't know what you would call it. We've done this with the city, and so I'm able to support them in various ways, um, whether that's doing signage for the parks and uh, providing gardening areas and um, uh, prayer restoration stuff. And so um, I'm, I'm thinking that's probably the route we're going to go. I'm going to push to do with the county. So, um, but I, you know, like I said, in the future, I don't know where it's going to go. Talk to them, but I think. That's something that this body should have a voice in as well. Concern. Thank you, Matthew, for bringing that to our attention. Um, I think if you're interested, food and farm would be a great working group to like help work on that with you. If that's something you're interested in, um, or if you want any support, John, something. <laughs> and in leadership, I'll I'll talk to between the three of us um, at the very least. Um, I'll see if maybe there's room to have a moot come at least talk, answer questions about what barriers there are and what tools the Food Policy Council has to help you in a move, move forward. But it is definitely in the food system plan and there are any number of ways. Well, from what I understand, <laughs> what I understand is it's grant funded mm -hmm. and they're not sure they're going to um, even attempt to go back after that grant or if there's one available, um, which is, again, you know, and that's the thing with grants. They're not sometimes sustainable, but um, I was asking the question, is it county doesn't want to approach it or the county it's not available? Like what's why would you not go after it if it's renewable? But um and maybe it's not a priority. I don't know. Um or it's not worth the funding. I don't know. But that's the conversation that I want to have and say, you know, hey, this is important. And, and it I'm being a little selfish too because it helps me to be able to get out into the community. We've already taken over we're going to run BA this season uh, and then two in North Lawrence that's on her. She has like 13 sites. So uh, Haskell Stinson, we're going to take over those two or those three um, projects. And um, if I had more people, I'd take over more, but I've got stuff on campus that I have to do too. And so, um, you know, and that I don't know if it's just funding and a money situation or if it's, you know, what the whole situation is. That's why I'm asking questions, but mm -hmm. I just want to make sure it's on y'all's radar so that if it don't go, then you're like, hey, I don't want to even say anything. Thank you for bringing that up, Maggie. I just have a clarification. Um, so um, right now, uh, Ulman's position is grant funded. And in the past, so our office, the Double County Sustainability Office, used to be a joint office, City of Lawrence and Douglas County. And it's split, and now there's Kathy Richardson with the city of Lawrence. Common ground 
is the City of Lawrence program. But the county took it on while we were figuring out the split between the city and county. And all common ground sites are within the city of Lawrence right now, um, including the incubator farm. Um, so there is this new open space plan in development that does include access to land in farming. It hasn't been adopted yet, but some language of that kind is Are you talking about from the city or from the county? Because all the properties now are city. Um, yeah, all the properties right now. Talking about a future plan, is that county stepping away and doing their own thing? I don't know. I think like I think that there is. Um, I think that there needs to be a lot more communication and partnership for sure. And I would personally love to see more um, um, land access for young and beginning farmers, especially in sustainable agriculture. Um, but I just wanted to give the background on the offices and the program. And in, before we moved, there wasn't a manager. It was all grassroots. Um, so the grant ends in a few months from now, I think six or nine, I can't remember exactly. But there, I think staff is working on it. But I'll, I would love to talk to you, Maggie, too. I have just a couple comments relative to that. Uh, one is that anybody that's wanting to look at the impact that Common Ground has had on uh, beginning farmers should talk to the folks of Mellow Fields mm. because they started in a backyard and then a bigger backyard and then Common Ground. And now they are doing four acres of incredibly intense productive vegetables uh, and employing both people and uh, a significant economic impact for Douglas County. They are one of our biggest specialty crop producers. And they're a great example. Yes, yeah, yeah, a poster yeah. child for what common ground can do. Um, another thing that I want to just kind of put out there, everything is very loose in the works, but another potential long-term player in the farm ground accessibility picture is surprisingly tenants to homeowners. Mm. And I have been talking with them for quite some time now about the future of my property. Uh, two of my five parcels have been transferred to them now, the smaller parcels. Uh, I'm retaining life estate on uh, part of that land while they renovate one of the houses there. Um, but the big term, the big picture long-term vision that we have been talking about is having my land end up as their property in trust and set aside as open space to, that could be rented to, leased to, a beginning farmer, a, a small farmer, long term, not just a, a few year rolling lease like common ground, but potentially a 99 year lease uh, for very inexpensive. And then also having housing, affordable housing through tenants to homeowners available there on site. For farmers, for a farmer that needs it, or for farm workers that work for a farmer that lives somewhere else, or whatever. There's just a, a lot of ideas, but um, that vision's out there. And we've been talking about it for a couple of years now. Excellent. I'll, I'm going to follow up with you on that because this is something that comes up again tomorrow is the open space plan. So I'll bring up common ground, but also talking about who is available. Also, it, I didn't get a chance to ask Andrea Clark, but talking about who in the region and in the food shed is available for land trusts and who has the capital to to, uh, to grab retiring farms like they're, 
there are at least two more farms I can think of that are probably going to be coming up as, uh, as matters of concern in the next probably 10 to 15 years. I expect like my neighbors at the Walking Creek Lavender Farm. Um, and so I think what you're doing with tenants to homeowners is something I would very much like to be able to sit in on. Um, so I would like to follow up because that's very interesting and really valuable. Um, is there, I think we have, we have gone past time. This has been an excellent meeting. I think, I think unless there's any matter of pressing concern, I think we are ready to adjourn. And with that next meeting will be April 22nd in person location will be the Eudora, Pu Eudora public library at 14 East 9th street in Eudora, Kansas, and then also available virtually via teams at 6 30 PM. And uh, just shout out that right before that is the, uh, on the 20th is the fashion show and also Earth Day in the city and river cleanup and all kinds of awesome things. And Lawrence Farmer's Market opens up uh, April 13th at uh, 7.30 a.m. at 8.20 morning. Oh, we're going to shameless plug. Got it. <laughs>